going to tell us about series elastic compliance uh, during high power deceleration. Super. Oh, here we go. So, animal locomotion scientists have known about the role of serious elasticity in connection with muscle actuators for a long time and studied it in many different ways. And there's several different acknowledged functions of tendon elasticity in locomotion, one being energy conservation, as frequently exemplified by hopping marsupials here. It's been modeled as the slip model where energy upon impact with the ground is transiently stored in tendon stretch and then recycled for the next step or bounce. Another known function of tendon elasticity is in power amplification as frequently used by jumping anurans. And the idea here is that prior to takeoff over a prolonged period of time energy is stored in tendon stretch by muscle shortening contraction and then by virtue of being a quick uh, recoiling structure. Tendon provides a slingshot mechanism that propels the animal off the ground with much higher power than muscle contraction is capable of producing. But then there's also musculoskeletal control and I think that's where the picture maybe becomes a bit more blurred. I think there's likely to be some disagreements about whether it's a good idea to have an elastic spring connecting your muscle actuator to your skeletal frame. And particularly when we're talking about high precision, high force, and rapid movement, such as a posing thumb and index finger in this robot, it's, it is perhaps questionable whether serious elasticity is actually a good thing or not. And then there's the general topic from my talk, which is about tendon function in, in uh, attenuating powers. For instance, when all of these organisms hit the ground after their jump, the leg extensors are going to have to rapidly dissipate a considerable amount of impact energy. And we have a working hypothesis for how this energy dissipation actually happens, and it's essentially the inverse of the power amplification model. So we have a scenario where energy very rapidly is stored in the tendon when uh, kinetic energy is is uh, affected by gravity and the foot hits the ground. And after a transient storage of this energy, that energy is then released via tendon recoil for the muscles to undergo lengthening contractions and dissipate the energy. And the idea, the sort of overruling idea of this work is that having this elasticity in series with the muscle actuator reduces both the speed and power of active muscle lengthening. And why would you want to do that? Well, one of the reasons is to prevent actuator damage. This is basically a sarcomere level electron microscopy diagram showing that the sarcomeres are injured due to stretch as opposed to this pristine sarcomere environment. So we know a lot about uh, eccentric muscle damage at the cellular level, but we have a very limited understanding at the whole muscle level. There's a Fair few clues in the literature about what's going on when a muscle is lengthened, a whole muscle tendon unit. A lot of work done both in vivo and in situ on animals as well as human studies have shown that when you impose a rapid ramp lengthening of a muscle tendon unit, the muscle fascicles will, will actually attempt to stay isometric or even shorten. And something has to stretch and that's then presumably connective tissue including tendon. Another clue comes from an in situ study on the muscle of focus in my talk today, the turkey lateral gastrocnemius. So what Roberts and Assisi did was they hooked that muscle up to a muscle ergometer that controls length and measures force. And we have the whole tendon as well as the muscle in series here. And then they independently measured the length of the muscle fascicles, the contractile element using sonar micrometry. And to the right over here, you see the length trajectory as well as velocity of force of the whole muscle tendon unit 
when a ramp lengthening is imposed by the muscle motor. The muscle is stimulated and this is basically what the fascicles are doing. So during the period where force rises in the system, the fascicles shorten actively against serious elasticity stretch, only then to subsequently lengthen during the period of deactivation of the muscle where force goes down. So we basically wanted to examine whether this same decoupling of length trajectory of the whole muscle tendon unit versus the muscle fascicles occurs in vivo in high-powered deceleration maneuvers and what other way of doing that than strapping turkeys into a harness and elevate them to the ceiling and drop them to the floor. We obviously train the birds to do so and they're incredibly capable at performing these landings. So we train them to do three different landings, half a meter, one meter, and one and a half meter, which corresponds to one to three times the center of mass elevation above the ground. And once we had trained them, we instrumented the turkeys, the lateral gastrocnemius muscle here is a biarticular muscle with a leg flexion moment and an ankle extension moment. In the contractile region here, we put sonar micrometry crystals to measure the muscle fascicle length, as well as EMG electrodes to measure activity. And then turkeys, like other galliforms, have this bony tendon, which is essentially a perfect substratum for us to superglue strain gauges onto so we can measure single muscle force. And then after the experiment, we're able to calculate tendon length by deriving a tendon stiffness constant from the length of the fascicles, as well as the muscle force. We also measured leg kinematics, to get knee and ankle flexion during the landing. We did tendon travel experiments to get the muscle moment arms at, at, the, uh, at the knee and the ankle so we could compute MTU velocity as a whole. And since we then have a length measurement for, for both the whole muscle tendon unit as well as its separate components, we can look at velocity, power, and work to follow the flow of energy through the muscle tendon unit during the landing. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some summary data, and that's going to be on the bottom here, and there's going to be some sample diagrams up here. So starting with muscle force, to the left of this dark column is where the foot hits the ground, and then we have a rapid period of force developing in the muscle, and then subsequently after peak force, the force decays, and the landing is complete when force returns to pre-landing intensity. Force, as is probably not a surprise, incre increases with increase in, in drop height. And the important thing here is actually the period duration of the force rise period versus the force decay period. And you see that consistently, force decay lasts a lot longer than force rise. Knee and ankle flexion, there's a, again a pretty clear story here with increase in height, there's more flexion at both joints. Obviously the ankle is the one to pay attention to because that will stretch the muscle tendon unit. And you see that with increase in height, we have a lot more flexion at the ankle and most of this flexion actually occurs during the period where force is rising in the system. So the muscle tendon unit is stretched forcefully. In terms of fascicle, tendon in blue and MCU strains, this is all normalized to the initial length of these components prior to impact. And you see in black that the muscle tendon unit as a whole on, undergoes a ramp lengthening during force rise, which is essentially identical to the in situ experiment. Most of this lengthening, if not all of it, is taken up by tendon stretch. And the fascicles during the least powerful landings do lengthen during force decay, but once the intensity increases, the fascicles actually actively avoid lengthening during the period of force rise. And this lengthening of the MTU as a whole is taken up almost exclusively by tendon stretch, which is the negative strain values here. <coughs> Importantly, the fascicle behavior, both during force rise and force decay, is actually surprisingly constant. So as I've indicated, this story is about force and duration of these two periods of the landing. So that's why it becomes interesting when we compute power as a function of uh, tissue component uh, velocities and muscle tendon unit force. 
So basically, given that force rise consistently lasts a lot shorter, and this is the period where the muscle tendon unit as a whole is stretched the most, we have much higher negative powers or energy absorption that the MTU as a whole see than the fascicles see because they delay the stretch, the energy dissipating stretch till the force decay period. So that's entirely consistent with our working hypothesis about energy being rapidly stored in tendon, tendon stretch and then subsequently uh, at a slower rate released to active muscle length. And at the landings from the greatest height, this difference between energy absorbed by the muscle tendon unit during force rise and the energy absorbed by the fascicle during force decay is twofold, so it translates to a twofold power attenuation as a consequence of having this serious elasticity in the muscle tendon unit system. That obviously does not mean that the fascicles dissipate less energy because we know that tendon as a tissue is presumably only capable of dissipating about 10% of the energy that it stores. There are other <coughs> components of a musculoskeletal system such as soft tissue vibrations that may dissipate energy, but it basically means that the event of, dis of dissipating energy is redistributed temporally to a period where force is, is less, uh, uh, less potential for damage. So just to summarize, Sorry? Yeah, okay. So the idea is basically with this mechanism that ankle flexion rapidly stretches the MTU, stores energy in tendon stretch, and subsequently with the delay, energy is, dis is, energy is transferred from the tendon as it recoils to be absorbed, to di be dissipated by the muscle. And I probably won't have time to summarize that, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, I think it's clear that from what you showed that for, for large drops, the muscle contracts at the same time as the tendon unit can stretch. The stretch the tendon further, right? Absolutely. Why? Is that uh, a side effect of a uh, new direct reflex, or is that something that's, that's very important for accelerating work? For subsequent? Uh, as for decelerating work. For, de for de decelerating work. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the the muscle contraction is obviously also important in increasing leg, leg stiffness. And we do see antagonist contraction as well. So, so there, there is really clear evidence of, of leg stiffness being modulated with, with height as well. And shortening the muscles is, as far as I can think, the way to, to actually increase leg stiffness. So is this, is this co-contraction or is this just the action? Well, there is actually a, a co-contraction as well of the tibialis anterior, which is the which is the ankle ankle flexor. That's not really part of this story. Okay. One more question. Do you or Monica have a Grandview five theory about uh, why in your experiment you say the force fluctuates depending on the drop, which you said the force is constantly repetitive? Well, this force is force at the level of the muscle. And if I'm interpreting Monica correctly, her force is for the entire system. And so you, you look at the force of the drug reaction, you, you find it to be constant the drop? No, uh, I don't. <laughs> we do have that data as well, and certainly ground reaction force increases with height. It certainly does. I I think the perturbation intensity is just so much higher here. That.
Yeah, this is decidedly one-shot ballistic locomotion. Nothing steady about this. 